Ah, uh, Kyle, you're awake! Great! Have you ever heard about extreme space objects? Yes, not just regular objects like stupid pathetic flying rocks like asteroids, but objects that are colder than space itself, and black holes that are so big they devour entire galaxies worth of stars. In fact, there are four levels of extreme space objects out there in the universe, and I want to show the viewer what each level is like, Kyle. Starting with level one of extreme space objects, extreme stars. But to know what extreme stars even are, we first have to find out the exact definition of what a star is. In the most simple form, stars are mostly hydrogen and helium gas. And gravity crushes those atoms together, fusing them into helium and releasing energy. That energy pushes back against gravity. And this balance is what makes the star give off light and remain alive. Simple. It's exactly how our sun works. But then what would make a star extreme? Well, this is where their size, mass, and temperature come in. Extreme stars will either be way smaller, larger, hotter, colder, or deader and way more compressed than regular stars like our sun. Now, almost every star in the universe can be plotted on this simple diagram. Temperature on the bottom, brightness on the left. Massive blue stars are right up here. They have short lives and burn themselves out in millions of years. Yellow stars like our sun, middle of the road. 10 billion years of mediocrity. Then way down here on the right, red dwarfs. Tiny, cool, and not the brightest. Just like you, Timmy. I know you're watching, and I know you failed your grades last year, so pay attention. Now, red dwarfs may be small, but that means they live for trillions of years. That alone makes them extreme because that's way longer than even the age of the universe right now. They should be the most boring stars in the universe, except they're not. Because being small makes them unstable and violent. They fire off solar flares hundreds of times stronger than our suns, enough to fry any planets unlucky to orbit them, unless it's a super planet. A real example of a red dwarf like this is TRAPPIST-1. Compared to our sun, it's only 9% the mass, 12% its radius, and 0.05% of the sun's brightness, and half its temperature. Yes, it's barely bigger than Jupiter. Though it's so crazy that it blasts out storms of radiation constantly. And surrounding it are seven Earth-sized planets packed together tighter than my family packed into a Fiat 500 because Dad lost his company car when he got laid off last year. Yes, all of these planets are literally closer to TRAPPIST-1 than Mercury is to the Sun. And astronomers once thought some of those worlds might even be habitable. Until we realized that TRAPPIST-1 would literally roast those planets alive with its radiation. Most likely. Imagine living on Earth, but every few days the sky explodes with star stuff that could strip away your atmosphere. That's TRAPPIST-1, a tiny star that murders entire planets. Basically, hot plasma churns straight from the core to the surface, tangling magnetic fields that snap and release monster stellar flares. But what about the extreme stars on the other side of the diagram? The massive blue stars. These are called O-types and can evolve into wolf rayet stars. Much like the most massive star ever discovered, R136A1. This is perhaps up to 291 times the mass of our sun. It's also 9 million times brighter than it as well. Surface temperature, 53,000 degrees. Radius, 40 times larger. And its winds, they blow off the equivalent of Earth's mass every single month. This thing is literally shedding like a snake. And the best part is that even with all the mass loss, it's still destined for the most violent end in the universe, a hypernova. See, when a massive star runs out of fuel, its core collapses in on itself, triggering a supernova, one of the biggest explosions in the universe. But what makes O-types and wolf rayets interesting? See, wolf rayets have a delicate balance. That's why they are so extreme and so rare. Not only do these stars have to rotate fast enough to shed their outer layers, but they also can't go too fast, otherwise they will lose too much of what's called angular momentum. You know, spin energy. It also can't have too many metals, which is space language for anything that just isn't hydrogen or helium. But in order for a hypernova gamma ray burst event to happen with those jets we usually see, they have to originate from within the core. And as they tear through the star, they trigger explosive fusion, creating the element nickel 56, which is what allows us to see these events from Earth and also be 10 times more powerful than a supernova. And that's the spectrum of stars, Kyle. 
On one side, the tiniest stars, barely glowing spheres, living trillions of years. But the most massive stars we know can all die in like 5 million years or 10 million years. And that's right. Stars are so extreme, they burn through their fuel faster than you go through your plates at a buffet. Yeah, I see how you behave with those places, Kyle. Disgusting. <laughs> stars are the fundamental level of every extreme object. And they all emit insane amounts of radiation. So it's a good thing today's video is sponsored by Radio Code, the next generation smart radiation detector. With 15 to 20 times higher sensitivity than a standard Geiger counter, thanks to what's called scintillation crystals, Radio Code can pick up background radiation in real time while you walk. It logs radiation with GPS coordinates so you can literally map hotspots on Google Maps and then flex them on Radioverse, Radio Code's free platform where users share radiation data tracks from all around the world. On top of that, the free mobile app lets you visualize isotopes like cesium-137 or uranium-238. You know, nuclear reactor stuff. But even more interesting is visualizing the natural isotope potassium-40 that exists in our everyday lives and even in your body. All of this is complete with gamma spectroscopy and continuous spectrograms so you can track spikes over time. The device itself is compact, ergonomic, with sound, light, and vibration alerts, 200 plus hours of battery life, and USB-C charging. It works standalone or synced via Bluetooth on your phone and PC. So if you want to start exploring the hidden radiation around us and to avoid turning into a Chernobyl fish, go to radiocode.com slash gravipool and grab your radio code device today. And remember, always follow safety guidelines when handing radioactive materials, including if you ever handle stars, the foundation of every extreme space object. So much so that some of the most incredible objects in the universe are binary systems. Two stars orbiting each other. In fact, up to 85% of star systems could be binaries. And when two massive stars orbit each other, it's really not peaceful. It's violent. And Ete Karene is one of the most extreme space objects ever discovered. It's about 7,500 light years away. It's made of not one, but two giants. The first star is potentially up to 80 times the mass of the sun, and the second is potentially up to 100 times the mass of the sun. But that's only today. When it was born, it was perhaps up to 200 times the sun's mass. How is that possible? Well, here's what makes it terrifying. The largest star is shedding itself because it's a variable star. That means it can radically change its brightness and size in violent explosive events. In fact, when this happens, the brightness from this larger star is so ridiculous that we even observed it in 1843 and for years became the second brightest star in the night sky. And the smaller star that orbits it, it crashes through that same material, stirring the whole thing into something so hideous, it's called the Homunculus Nebula. A perfectly formed miniature human being, like myself. Wait, wait, like you. <laughs> I'm not a human. No, 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 never was. 100%. Anyway. Now you're thinking, Nebula, what the f*** does that mean? Well, this is where we introduce level two of extreme space objects, Nebula. Nebula are leftover hydrogen and helium gas from stars that have died. And no matter how that happened, they push this gas back into the universe, and that gas then forms beautiful clouds that look like this, and that, and also this. In fact, this is where brand new stars will be born. And these clouds are home to some of the most extreme behaviors. You know, like being the coldest place in the known universe. An example of this is the Boomerang Nebula. It sits about 5,000 light years away from the sun and it's so cold it actually dips below the temperature of the universe itself. How? Well, this nebula is formed by a dying star that's ejecting its outer layers at insane speeds, over 500,000 kilometers per hour. That rapid shedding causes the gas to cool down through something called adiabatic cooling. Basically, all you need to know is it's the same way compressed air in a can feels cold when you spray it to clean your disgusting keyboard. The result? Temperature plunges to just one Kelvin. That's minus 272 degrees Celsius, only a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. The lowest limit physics theoretically allows. That makes the Boomerang Nebula not just colder than interstellar space, but the coldest known natural place in the universe. But that's just level two, gas from stars. Level three, however, oh boy, that is where extreme corpses come in, the dead bodies of the stars we just covered. Objects so extreme, they determine the nature of the universe itself. 
But before we talk about what makes these star corpses so extreme, I have to explain the two ways that stars can even die and become corpses. If the dying star is small like our sun, they get really big as they get old, puff off their outer layers and leave behind a white dwarf. This is the leftover core of the star made of degenerate electrons, which has the mass of the sun and size of the earth. However, if the star is above 8 to 10 solar masses, the second way they can die is through a supernova. What remains will either be a neutron star or a black hole. But what exactly are these two extreme objects? Firstly, the neutron star is a city-sized sphere of degenerate neutrons made of matter so dense, a teaspoon of it weighs billions of tons. See, while white dwarfs are made of tightly packed atoms from leftover carbon and oxygen due to intense gravitational collapse when it, you know, died, this collapse only stops going further because the electrons get so close together, it's impossible for the white dwarf to get smaller. Neutron stars take this a step further. The protons and electrons in the star actually smash together, creating neutrons, forming a solid ball of pure neutron nuclear matter with no empty space left at all. This process means we now call them degenerate electrons and degenerate neutrons. And they come in three variations. Regular fast spinning ones that exist, magnetars that also rotate but emit the most violent magnetic fields you could imagine, and then the neutron stars that spin so fast and beam out radiation, visible from Earth, are called pulsars. These rotate hundreds of times per second, but they do slow down as they age. The fastest one we've ever found? PSR J1748 2446 AD. It spins 716 times every second. The second extreme object supernova outcomes are black holes. This is where the core of the star is such a strong mass and gravity when it collapses that it becomes a point, the singularity. Now, you know this, but did you know the real structure of a black hole, Kyle? A black hole isn't just a void, it has layers. The event horizon is the ultimate point of no return where light simply cannot escape, cross it and you can never leave. To the outside universe, the event horizon defines how big the black hole appears, even though the singularity is infinitely small with infinite density. Yes, infinite. However, the event horizon's size is called the Schwarzschild radius, and just inside that, you have the inner event horizon. Outside of these, a photon sphere where light bends, and an ergosphere where you can orbit the black hole and not immediately die. But what you see from Earth is not actually the event horizon. It's the shadow. Gravity is already so strong in that area that light goes on a roller coaster and you no longer can see anything. In addition to this, some theories suggest black holes could have hair on their event horizon. These are tiny quantum fingerprints encoding information of what fell through the event horizon on their surface. Oh, and uh, by the way, if you thought pulsars rotated fast, black holes can actually rotate even faster, like up to 95% the speed of light. The most extreme version, actually confirmed with data of these black holes, the 66 billion solar mass black hole behemoth monster known as Ton 618. Wow, this beast is the center of its own galaxy consuming billions of stars alive. The radiation is immense and the brightness outshines almost anything else in the universe. But what if the most extreme version isn't the biggest black hole, but the smallest? That's right, meet the unicorn. The tiniest black hole candidate, just three times the mass of the sun, barely massive enough to exist at all, to the point that some scientists believe it's just a stripped down star. But basically, it's just as rare as a unicorn. If the star that made this potential unicorn black hole was even a tiny bit smaller, the unicorn would just be another neutron star. Boring. Instead, this little monster sits just 1500 light years away and its event horizon is only about 18 kilometers wide. Basically, the length of Manhattan, but instead of skyscrapers, it's a singularity of death. Yet inside that tiny sphere, an unstoppable singularity. Proof that even the smallest black hole is still a point of infinite gravity and would still consume you and the Earth. And yes, there are even different kinds of singularities that could be possible deep within black holes that allow even the most outrageous things to happen. Maybe. Like traveling to the 11th dimension. Maybe. Nah, actually, you know what, Kyle, it's amazing that black holes can have such different sizes, but Ton 618 is actually just more extreme, more sexy, and more beautiful than this tiny monstrosity. And on that note, the real level of extreme objects begins at level 4, when black holes feed and become quasars. If anything interacts with a black hole, mostly stars and star stuff, they'll be shredded and swirled into an accretion disk, 
heating up to millions of degrees, blasting X-rays brighter than whole galaxies. When a black hole large enough gains an accretion disk from, you know, basically being the center of a galaxy, they ignite and light up the universe. That's what we call a quasar, like Tom. But did you know that there is something more extreme than that? Yup, the most extreme objects in the universe come in pairs quite often. Two white dwarfs which go boom with a unique supernova, two neutron stars which go kilonova, two black holes which absorb into each other, but there is even a quasar that has two supermassive black holes, both feeding and with the larger one blasting two death beams of energy across the universe. Yes, a binary quasar. OJ287 is a different kind of beast. It's a binary supermassive black hole system. The smaller one of 150 solar masses punches through an 18 billion solar mass black hole quasar accretion disk every 12 years like clockwork and boom, the whole galaxy flares up brighter than a trillion suns. We've even studied this from Earth for 130 years. How? Because this extreme object is also known as a blazar. This is simply a quasar whose relativistic jets are pointed straight at, well, at Earth. And every time the smaller black hole goes through the accretion disk, we can detect violent flares. And yes, that's the real model I'm showing you, Kyle. That's what we generated, and that's what it looks like. All of this to show you that extreme space objects start from some of the smallest little stars and expand to the brightest and most violent beasts in the known universe. And at the core of everything extreme that we just looked at, stars. It's a pity our sun is just so damn boring.